diet is one of the biggest contributors to disease and death. But which diet is best? Carnivore or vegan? Low fat or low carb? Let's look at the evidence. I'm Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. I practiced obstetrics and gynecology for 20 years until I landed on the other side of the sheets as a very sick patient. When my own body betrayed me, I took a handful of pills to manage my disease and another handful to counteract the side effects. My health was out of control. Through surgery, medications, and lots of prayers, I regained my strength only to face another diagnosis. My doctor challenged me to make radical changes through lifestyle medicine. Now I feel great and I want to help you make changes that make a difference. Healthy Looks Great on You podcast takes you to many medical schools so you can learn the power of lifestyle medicine. If you're ready to take control of your health, you're in the right place. Whether you're focused on prevention or you're trying to manage a condition, I'll give you practical steps to start your own journey toward better health because healthy looks great on you. There is no question, diet contributes to health. But there are a lot of conflicting opinions about which diets are healthiest. And the confusion is understandable. Think about it. If someone asked me what diet I follow, I might say this or that. But if I told the truth, I might also say I had a big piece of cake last week. And I'm not saying I did or I didn't, but you get the picture. For that reason, population studies can be more helpful. We will talk about blue zones in an upcoming episode. These are places on the planet where longevity is most common. And they study what these people eat as one contributor. And there's only one city in the United States on that list. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But spoiler alert, they don't eat the standard American diet. But the main thing is diet matters because eating a healthy diet can help you live longer and reduce the risk of diseases like heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, and dementia. Of course, a poor diet also contributes to obesity, which increases the risk of all of these. And it makes you feel bad too. But decisions about diet are complicated. Some people's taste buds are just programmed to crave sugar and fat. Other people love fruits and vegetables. And emotions can play a big role, as well as mental health in general. On top of that, we have cultural norms or religious guidelines, and those heavily influence diet choices in some people. Sometimes in a good way, and sometimes not. Availability and affordability influence food choices as well. And some people are just picky, and I feel sorry for picky eaters. I literally like everything. But that wasn't always the case. When I was a little girl, I was super picky, and boy, did I outgrow it. When I was in elementary school, I took my lunch every day. My mom would take me to the grocery store and let me pick out what I wanted. But most kids ate in the cafeteria. And in the 1970s, they served beets about once a week. Now, I love beets, but they never even touched my lips until about 10 years ago. And I think it's safe to say that most of the elementary school kids thought they were grody to the max, as we used to say. Anyway, one day, the principal came through and made everyone eat their beets. I sure was glad I took my lunch that day. And there was this one kid who hated them. So he stuck them down in his milk carton. I mean, desperate times call for desperate measures. But he didn't get away with it. The principal came around. She made him drink the milk, tear open the carton, and eat the beets. I'm pretty sure that wouldn't fly in 2024. But my point is that often we have to eat what's right in front of us. I'll talk more about that in a bit, but let's look at some specific dietary guidelines. Pretty much all medical societies agree that a healthy diet consists of fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and whole grains. And 
They recommend limiting red meat, processed meat, which, by the way, includes deli meat and things like chicken nuggets, and reducing unhealthy fat, sugar, salt, and alcohol. In other words, kind of the exact opposite of the standard American diet. After all, it's called S-A-D for short. And that is sad. Oh, wait, what? You want to know my sources? Well, how about the World Health Organization, the American Cancer Society, and every other reputable cancer organization, the American Heart Association, and the USDA? And they make these recommendations based on data from meta-analysis. In order to understand how medical research is evaluated, let's go to a really short class in many medical school and talk about meta-analysis. It's basically where they take a whole bunch of studies and pile them up so they have lots more data. I hope you know that's the first grade version, but let's move on anyway. I did a bunch of research for you to get some facts about different diets, and whoo, there are definitely conflicting recommendations. But let's review. First, we will talk about the Mediterranean diet. There's probably more data on the Mediterranean diet and its impact on health than any other diet. And it's generally considered to be healthy. And remember, I mentioned blue zones? Well, more than one of them are located in the Mediterranean. But did you know that the Mediterranean diet isn't really precisely defined? I mean, it emphasizes fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, beans, nuts, and seeds, and of course, olive oil. It also includes fish, poultry, and dairy products, as well as a limited amount of red meat. And it's usually topped off with a glass of red wine. And since it uses so much olive oil, medical studies use it to compare that diet to a low-fat diet. And in medical studies, it's been shown to reduce the risk of stroke, heart disease, and basically dying of any of those. And it's even been suggested that there's a decrease in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and certain cancers. So that's good, right? Yeah. But is it the oil, the wine, the grains, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds? See, that's another reason it's hard to evaluate diets because they are so complex and likely It's a combination of things. And because there is lots of data about the benefits of the Mediterranean diet, there have been some spinoffs. And those guidelines are outlined in a bit more detail. The DASH diet was targeted to lower blood pressure. DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And if you have high blood pressure, you should listen to episode 108, where I discuss the DASH diet in more detail, as well as four reasons to control your blood pressure. The DASH diet recommends four to five servings of fruit a day, four to five servings of vegetables a day, as well as two to three servings of low-fat dairy each day. Now, total calories from fat should be less than 25%. And interestingly, the addition of low-fat dairy seems to lower blood pressure more than a strictly vegetarian diet. Of course, lowering sodium intake is crucial to controlling blood pressure. And if you want more information about salt in the diet, listen to episode 122. Not only have studies shown that the DASH diet is effective at lowering blood pressure, it also reduces the risk of colorectal cancer, heart disease, and that big old pain in the toe, gout. Then there's the MIND diet. It's designed to prevent dementia, and cognitive decline. Think of it like a marriage between the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Seriously, they mixed the two. And this diet is kind of a do and don't list, and I really like list. In fact, I have an entire episode on preventing cognitive decline where I talk about the MIND diet in more detail. It's episode 112, Save the Brain. There's a list of the foods you should eat on the MIND diet green leafy vegetables, vegetables in general, but preferably not the starchy ones, berries, 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 and more berries, nuts, olive oil, whole grains, fish, mostly the fatty ones, beans, and poultry, and to my friends in the South, that does not mean fried chicken, y'all. And this diet originally included wine, but 
I think the Baptist got involved because that one's been questioned and some people recommend removing that recommendation. (laughs) I hope you appreciate my sense of humor. Now, here are the don'ts on the MIND diet. Butter and margarine. I know, I'm such a better cook when I add a stick or two, but you know it can't be good for you. Cheese is also a painful one, but cheese is so high in fat and we consume it by the truckload in this country. Red meat, fried food, told you that KFC wasn't good, and sweets. Now, let me stop right here. There is literally no healthy diet that includes sweets. None. But sugar is so addictive, and it's really not that easy to give up, although it is possible. And it's a really bad actor because it causes inflammation, and inflammation wreaks havoc in our bodies. It's responsible for a whole list of chronic conditions that can make you miserable and even kill you. An anti-inflammatory diet has been touted to cure all sorts of diseases, and whether it does or not, it is considered to be a very healthy diet. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Anti-inflammatory diets vary, but generally speaking, they are a combination of DASH and Mediterranean, and they're not very different than the MIND diet. Do eat fruits and vegetables, brown rice, lean poultry, eggs, fatty fish, legumes, beans, nuts, seeds, and oats. Focus on whole foods and avoid sweets, snack foods, processed meats and cheeses, sugar-sweetened drinks, and fried foods. There is no diet that's actually proven to reduce inflammation, but eating a so-called clean diet with less sugar, less unhealthy fat, and eliminating processed foods can help. It can help with things like headache, sleep, mood, blood pressure and blood sugar, as well as GI distress, joint pain, and acne. Oh, and did I mention weight and energy levels? Now, instead of mini medical school, let's go back to the prereqs in college and talk about anthropology. No, not the trendy clothing store, but the study of human culture and their development throughout history. Why in the world are we talking about that? Well, because the paleo diet is supposedly based on what they ate during the Paleolithic era or the old Stone Age. Think, yabba dabba doo. You know, Fred Flintstone, he loved his brontosaurus ribs and his brontosaurus burgers. But since the dinosaurs have been extinct for a while now, the paleo diet is mostly meat and fish. You can eat a little seeds and nuts and veggies and fruit, but nothing green and no dairy. And some people advocate for this diet for its health and weight benefits, Although, if you ask me, Fred was just a little on the pudgy side. However, he was very active using his legs to power that car. And we could all benefit from that as well as eliminating processed foods. You know, sometimes I even wonder if Rock Donald's or Bronto King were even real. But then again, I've never visited Bedrock, so I can't say for sure. Okay, let's move on. Let's take it to a more extreme level, though. The carnivore diet. The word literally means meat eater. So that pretty much sums it up. People who eat the carnivore diet eat only animal products, including eggs and dairy, but nothing from plants. They eat red meat, white meat, and organ meat. Meat. Yikes. Is it good for you? Eh, I got some bad news for the meat lovers. There's no fiber in animal products. So you're probably going to have some trouble pooping. And it also lacks many nutrients, vitamins, and antioxidants. They say it helps you lose weight and improves mood and blood sugar, but listen up. There's not a single medical study to support this, and the general consensus is it ain't good for you. But if you want to sit on the toilet all day and strain, avoid vegetables, fruits, legumes, beans, grains, nuts, and seeds. Thanks, but I've got better things to do. How does this stuff even get started? Well, in 2017, an orthopedic surgeon promoted this diet because, you know, orthopedic surgeons get all kinds of training on nutrition. And you might also want to know that he lost his medical license over concerns about his competency. 
Uh, but don't worry, you got it back with a requirement to be supervised. My point is, do your homework. Not everyone is a good source, and some people are just trying to sell books. In 1972, Dr. Atkins published his book, The Diet Revolution. But it wasn't until about the 2000s that it really took off, and it popularized the high-protein, low-carb diet. And if you aren't paying attention in class, sit up and listen to this. There was never any clinical data to support his claims, and it's been criticized as unbalanced and unhealthy. By who? Well, some heavy hitters like the American Medical Association, the American Dietetic Association, and the American Heart Association, because you don't really even need to go to medical school to figure out that a high-fat diet is not good for your heart. But now, here we are in 2024, and we have keto. Oh, you're right. It isn't a new diet. It's been recommended since prohibition, mostly for childhood epilepsy and other neurologic conditions. And there is some science to back that up. But now, it's as popular as big hair in the 80s among people who don't have neurologic conditions. And it definitely can help jumpstart weight loss. But in the long run, there are some risks, especially for your heart, but also your liver gets overworked trying to process all that fat, and the kidneys struggle to handle all the protein. And since you have to limit foods that contain fiber like grains and beans, you'll be sitting in the stall almost as long as the carnivores. Okay, I think I just heard the bell ring for another class in mini medical school. I promise, this one is really interesting. This diet is called keto because the goal is to induce a metabolic state called ketosis. And when this occurs, your liver produces ketones by breaking down fat. This diet restricts carbohydrates so severely that your body runs low on fuel. And when you don't have enough glucose in your bloodstream, your body breaks down its fat stores. So yes, you will lose weight because your body is starving for energy and breaking down fat in order to function. So that's good if you need to lose some weight. But your body actually prefers carbohydrates for fuel. And with this diet, only 5 to 10% of intake is from carbohydrates. Instead, the focus is on high fat. I'm talking 60 to 80% and moderate protein, 15 to 20% of the diet. And it takes about four days to get to ketosis. And you may feel sick until you get through what's known as the keto flu. But as a bonus, your breath will smell like juicy fruit. That's from the acetone. Note of caution, if you're not on the keto diet and your breath smells fruity, this can be a warning sign of diabetes. Now, here's the deal. A lot of us love our carbs, bread, pasta, potatoes, especially French fried, and there's plenty of energy to be found in those foods. But we tend to eat them refined, depleted of nutrients, and to the excess. So yeah, if you cut that out, you're going to lose a significant amount of weight, especially in the first three to six months. But listen, you really ought to discuss with your doctor if you're eating this way long term, because without a variety of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, you will likely be deficient in some micronutrients like magnesium, phosphorus, selenium, as well as vitamins B and C. And by the way, you really should have your cholesterol checked. Now, we've been talking about protein, and I'll have an upcoming episode on that, but let's go ahead and talk about counting macros. You may have heard that term before if you listen to my podcast episode on nutrition, or you may be counting macros to maintain weight. To sum it up, macros refers to the big three, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. The typical recommendation is that you figure out how many calories you need every day and get 45 to 65% of them from carbohydrates, 20 to 35% of them from fats, and 10 to 35% of them for protein. So in addition to understanding your daily caloric needs, you also have to know the carb, fat, and protein content of everything you put in your mouth and track it. As a reminder, carbohydrates contain four kilocalories per gram, Protein is also 4 kilocalories per gram, and fat is 9 kilocalories per gram. So that factors into the equation, too. Whew! 
There are a lot of apps to simplify it, and some people have success with it, but personally, it sounds taxing to me. However, I think it's beneficial to keep a food log for a while because you might be surprised. And if you are counting macros, I want to mention that protein needs are typically 46 grams a day for women and 56 grams a day for men, but it can vary based on other things. And most Americans get plenty of protein, often even more than they need. But there's this big push right now with marketing protein bars and protein shakes and protein this and protein that. And every time I order a salad or a bowl at a restaurant, they say, would you like a protein with that? And it's probably just a way for them to charge more. But I really wish they'd start asking people, would you like a vegetable with that? And that brings me to the next diet, vegetarian. But there's not just one kind of vegetarian diet. There's lacto-vegetarian, lacto-ovo-vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, otherwise known as flexitarian, and another variation called pescatarian, which allows for the consumption of fish. Okay, slow down. Let's start at the beginning. First of all, vegetarian and vegan are not the same. But let's look at vegan. Think of a vegan diet as the very opposite of a carnivore diet. You can't eat any animal-based foods, not even honey from bees. And most people who are vegan are concerned about the ethical treatment of animals. So you can eat a vegan diet and still be very unhealthy because Pop-Tarts are vegan, honey buns are vegan, and a big old cherry Coke from Sonic is vegan. Now, I will say most people who practice a vegan diet don't eat junk food either, but you get the point. If you'd like to learn more about a healthy vegan diet, listen to episode 121. I interviewed Terry Edwards, content creator of Eat Plant Based. She is a certified food for life instructor with the Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine. The president of that organization is a staunch vegan. His name is Dr. Neil Barnhart, and he wrote a book called The Power Food Diet. I recommend it, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Now, I'm not really vegan, but I have been following this diet for a week and lost five pounds. But let's talk about a vegetarian diet. A vegetarian diet does not include meat, but the variations I mentioned earlier may allow for things like eggs and dairy. And I also mentioned semi-vegetarian and flexitarian, and these people may eat fish and sometimes even chicken. Now, let's think about that for a minute. A Mediterranean diet is actually considered flexitarian, a version of vegetarian. Now, you probably know that I am a board-certified lifestyle medicine physician, and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine recommends a whole food, plant-predominant diet. So that means a diet rich in whole grains and cereals and fruits and vegetables and legumes and nuts, but not meat or animal products such as dairy and eggs. Let's look at what the data says about plant-based diets. There's been a lot of research over many years in various places in the world that prove plant-based diets decrease your risk for heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and some cancers. Are there risks? Yes, People who eat plant-based diets have to be very intentional to get enough protein. But listen, plants do contain protein, things like chickpeas and beans and legumes and nuts and some vegetables as well as quinoa. They also contain essential minerals and vitamins that our body needs to function, with one exception, vitamin B12. So it all comes down to choosing the right foods, and we always say, Eat the rainbow, because if you eat foods that have a variety of color, you'll get a variety of nutrients. For example, spinach is really high in iron, and so are lentils, and they have protein too. You know, I talk about plant-based nutrition all the time, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But if you are interested in following a plant-based diet, wouldn't it be nice for someone to say, here's what you should eat for the next month, and here's a grocery list, and here are all the recipes. Well, you're in the right place because I'm actually working on that. It's going to take me a while to put it all together, so the best way for you to stay in the know is to sign up for my email list. Just go to my website, www.healthylooksgreatonyou.com, and you'll get some early bonus recipes while you're there. Now, before we leave the topic of different types of diet, I want to touch on intermittent fasting. 
Intermittent fasting has been proposed as a way to help with pre-diabetes as well as weight loss. And at first there was a lot of buzz that this was going to be the end all. And like everything else, it petered out a bit. But some people do it and they have success, so let me give you a little rundown. There are a couple of different ways to do it. One is called the alternate day fasting. And yeah, if you only eat every other day, you're going to lose weight. That's just really hard for most people. So what most people do is time-restricted feeding. And this is limiting your eating to an 8 to 10 hour period during the day and not eating any other time. And so the reason this may work is that it aligns your circadian rhythm. But sustained significant weight loss has not really been reported. So how do you decide which diet is best for you? First of all, let's talk about some things we can agree on. Whole food is best, not processed food, not packaged food, and certainly not ultra processed food. And what we really ought to call it is what we used to call it, and that's junk food. And my mom always used to say, garbage in, garbage out. Oh yeah, almost forgot. I mentioned there is only one city in the United States that's considered a blue zone, and that is Loma Linda, California. What's in Loma Linda, California that sets it apart? Well, there's a large population of people who are practicing Seventh-day Adventist. And Seventh-day Adventist don't drink, they don't smoke, and they are mostly vegetarians. So there's that. Here are the cliff notes for a healthy diet. Eat at home and get your food from the grocery store. I know it's hard. That's one reason I'm working on this 30-day meal plan. Also, Remember, availability is a huge contributor to what we eat. I'm way more likely to eat a piece of dessert at Bunko than I am at home because I don't have dessert at home. So we need to think about availability and prepare for that, and I'll talk more about that later. But remember the kid who ate the beets? He had to eat them, and they were right in front of him. And that's what we do when we get hungry. We will eat what is right in front of us, even if it's not really what we want. Planning and preparation are as important as knowledge. And you know what else is important? Portions. Here's a little secret. Fiber keeps you feeling full and it keeps you from overeating and it also helps you go to the bathroom. The best things you can drink are water, coffee, and unsweet tea. And remember, there's not a diet out there that says sugar is okay. The bottom line is none of us eat perfectly and maybe there isn't even a perfect diet. But I hope this episode helps you assess the risk and benefits. A whole food diet high in nutrients is best for your health. And healthy looks great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or healthcare provider and take medication as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop and recommendations may change.